from Luke chapter 9, verses 59 through 62. Then Jesus said to someone else, Follow me. He replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. Someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those in my house. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. I'm already being poured out like a sacrifice to God, and the time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith. At last the champion's wreath that is awarded for righteousness is waiting for me. The Lord, who is the righteous judge, is going to give it to me on that day. He's giving it not only to me, but also to all those who have set their heart on waiting for his appearance. Do your best to come to me quickly. Demas has fallen in love with the present world and has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. He has been a big help to me in the ministry. I sent Tychus to Ephesus. When you come, bring along the coat I left with Carpus and Taros. Also bring the scrolls and especially the parchments. So ends the reading of God's holy word. All right. Well, I can't tell you how good it is to be back amongst you. First of all, we had a uh, wonderful trip to uh, St. Louis, uh, visiting some friends there. Bonnie uh, went on to her 85th high school reunion. <laughs> I didn't tell you said that. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Can you be bought? <laughs> She's due back today. I came back on Tuesday of this past week because I had a sermon to write. Now, you're going to appreciate the fact that I waited till the last minute to write the sermon. I didn't start writing it on Tuesday as we get into what the sermon's all about. But uh, we do have uh, some very dear friends in St. Louis, and they're going to be watching today on uh, either YouTube or on the website. So give a big shout out to St. Louis. Hi, Linda, Lois, and Deanie. I know Bob's probably not watching, but uh, maybe Deanie is. So anyway going to conduct a little test right now. I'm going to read to you a number of true stories. Your job, should you decide to accept it, is to determine what is the common thread throughout each of the stories. Okay? So that's what your job is. It's your responsibility to determine what the common thread is. So the first true story, now these are very true, came from Carolyn, and Carolyn says, I started decorating the bathroom in 2000 when I moved into this house. The cans of paint are still laying out 12 years later, and the work awaits completion. I still haven't decided what color of towels I want. Okay, that's the first story. Chris, you'll appreciate this. This comes from Sonia, and Sonia says, I am a teacher. I once left a bunch of homework ungraded for so long, I was embarrassed to give them back to the students, yet again ungraded. So I hid them, then went into the classroom and told them they had been stolen. <laughs> okay, got one more. In 1963, my dad asked me to knit him a scarf for the local sports team that he supported, saying that he would pay me for my work. I was 13 years old at the time, and he made the mistake of paying me advance, in advance for my time. You can guess that he never saw the scarf, and he died in 2010 at age 93 without ever seeing a return for his money. I should feel guilty, but dad was a kind and generous person and I don't think he really minded. That came from Pauline. 
Do you see a common thread throughout these stories? What is it? Procrastination. Procrastination. Here's one more. When I was asked to write a 2,000 word history essay for my architectural degree, I waited to the last week in order to act. I decided to set all my other tasks aside so I could wholly focus on the essay. I locked myself in my room, and yet for the first six days, I only wrote 100 words each day. My piano and guitar improved a ton. And I saw a lot of good movies, but this was not what I had been planning. It was only when the stress of a deadline and the possible retake of the entire module reached a breaking point on that last day that I managed to complete the last 1,400 words. What this showed me is that it is possible, but I wish that I was motivated by something other than stress. That came from Theo R. Okay, I think you get the connection. You guys get it. But well, let's hear just one more story to prove a point. This guy says, name, uh, John B. He says he started up the Sterling University Procrastination Society in 1980. It was a resounding success. Not one person bothered to return the registration form on time and we never got off the ground to holding that first meeting. Well done us. And he says, yay, John B. Now, are you someone who gets things done? Are you so organized that a deadline is merely something that you don't pay any attention to because you get things done right away? There's no holding you back, you're right on top of things. If you are, then I admire you if you're one of those people, because I am not. I claim the uh, trophy for being the worst procrastinator ever, okay? I don't care how bad you think you are, I'm much worse. For example, when I was in high school, I had a book report that was due on Monday morning, okay? A book report. Nine o'clock Sunday night, I still hadn't read the book. What I decided to do was go to bed at nine o'clock, wake up early, and begin reading the book. Somehow I got it done and turned in on time. Now I heard a story about a man who waited until the very last minute, until he was quite old, before he actually told his wife what he thought. He said he was slipping, it said he was slipping in and out of a coma for several months, and his wife was faithfully by his side every single day. One day when he came to, he whispered for his wife to come closer, because he was, had something to say, finally, on his deathbed. As she sat by him, he whispered, eyes full of tears. He said, you know what? You have been with me through all of the bad times. When I got fired, you were there to support me. And then he goes on to say, when my business failed, you were there. And when we lost the house that we were living in, you stayed right by my side. When my health started failing, you were still by my side. You never gave up on me. In fact, he says, when I got shot, you were there, right by my side. And he says, do you know what, dear? And she leans in a little bit closer and says, what, honey? Gently anticipating hearing some very good tender words. The sick husband then said, I'm beginning to think you're bad luck. <laughs> when we wait to do or to say things that we have always wanted to do or say, we miss out. We sometimes wait too long and we'll never get the chance. 
Think about this. How many letters have never been written? How many phone calls have never been made? And how many compliments has never been paid? How many I'm sorry's have not been spoken? How many thank you's have never been said? How many I love you's have never been whispered? How many commitments are still not made because we waited way too long? Now that brings us to one of the scriptures that Lynn read to us this morning. And in that reading this morning, from 2 Timothy, we learn, uh, we need to look at the context in which Paul was writing this letter to his understudy and very dear friend, Timothy. Paul had known and worked with Timothy for many, many years. Paul was the one who led Timothy to Christ. Paul even knew Timothy's mother. We know that from other uh, letters. And over the years had trained Timothy in the faith and he had taken him with them along on many missionary trips. It is widely believed that this second letter in Timothy was one of the last, if not the last letter that Paul ever wrote. Paul wrote it from a Roman prison and he knew that he didn't have long to live. He knew he was going to soon be executed. Paul was in prison in Rome and Timothy was in Ephesus. So Paul writes to Timothy and asks him to come see him in prison. Come see me. Just as soon as you can, he says. He asked Timothy to bring three things. His coat, his books, and most especially, his Bible. Now, the scripture today said scrolls for books and parchment for Bible, but that's what it is, his Bible. Then Paul says, do your best to come before winter. But now let me ask you something. What if Paul had written to you that way? If Paul wrote to you and said, come and come quickly, I don't have much time left. I really need to see you before I die. Please come and bring my coat, my books, and most importantly, or most especially, bring my Bible. I need your support and companionship. Would you have gone? Or would you have, like me, procrastinated? The phrase, come before winter, became the title of one of the most famous sermons ever preached. It was preached in a Presbyterian church over 37 times by its author, a Clarence McCarthy, one of the great preachers of the 20th century. After he delivered that sermon the first time, the church met and asked him to once a year repeat that sermon. Come before winter. Now the question is, did Timothy make it before winter or did he make it at all? Did he actually get there before Paul was executed? The truth is, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say so. Church history doesn't tell us that he made it or made it in time or made it at all. If Timothy had ever had time or taken the time to visit the great Apostle Paul is a great question. The phrase, come before winter, stirs in our minds. It stirs in my mind. It symbolizes all those deadlines that we all live under that at least I procrastinate, that I wait till the last minute, that I wait until I'm really stressed, thinking that I'm more creative when I'm stressed. In actuality, if I'm less stressed, I would be even more creative. But I wait too long. And so that phrase, come before winter, symbolizes to me every deadline that I've missed. So since we did not know if Timothy made it to Rome in time, suppose with me for a minute that he did not make it 
just suppose with me he wasn't there on time. Suppose he was delayed. What if he did not get to him immediately? What if he said, of course I'll go, but I have a lot to do before I go. I've got to say goodbye to people. When I plow my fields, I have to look back behind me. When I have dead, I need to bury the dead. When, as we learn from Scripture today, Jesus says, no, ignore that. Come with me. Do it now. Now is the time. And when Timothy gets down to the dock, I'm gonna, you're, you're uh, thinking with me here, he gets to the boat to go to Rome, and it already is winter. And the seas are too rough. The weather is too cold. He can't go now. So he better wait until spring to get to Rome to visit his dear friend, Paul. When spring comes, Timothy goes down to the docks and takes the first ship to Rome. And when he gets there, he wonders, am I in time? Imagine now Timothy going to the prison and telling the jailer, I'm here to see the Apostle Paul. And the jailer says, you must be Timothy. I'm sorry, but you haven't heard. Paul was executed last winter. And the jailer continues, Timothy, he was looking for you. Every day, every time, when I would go to his cell, Paul would say, Timothy, is that you? Is this Timothy? Here Timothy comes. And then Paul died. His last words were, tell Timothy, my beloved son in the faith, that I love him, and I always will throughout eternity. How would you feel if you were Timothy? You were not there because you thought you had better things to do than visit your friend that was about to die. We can all relate to that feeling of guilt I believe we all know that guilt feeling of missing something we all know the feeling of putting off and putting off and putting off so long that it soon becomes too late the last thing that we all need is more guilt we don't need that but I tell the story because if there is something God is asking you to do by all means do it now do it don't do what you feel. Do what God is asking you to do. And do it now. You won't have that feeling of guilt. Now the Bible says a lot about procrastination. I was amazed at all the things that it said. Just take a look at this first from the book of James. It says, anyone who knows good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Now, when I say things ought to do, now I say things like this. I know the things I ought to do, and I don't do them. And I know the things I shouldn't do, and I do those. But I procrastinate on the things I really want to do that change my life. Why is that? Why do I need to get everything else done ahead of time? All the little stuff, the insignificant things before I tackle what's really important. The Bible says that you procrastinate for one of five reasons, that's all. Just five reasons that we procrastinate. Number one is indecision. Uh, in the book of James it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all he does. Have you ever been at a restaurant and sent the waiter away because you can't decide what you want? We have. Every time I go out with Bonnie, she can't make up her mind on the menu. We always ask the waiter to come back. Now, I'm not picking on her because she's not here. She would vouch for that as well. But we send the waiter back because she can't make up her mind. It's indecision. It's one of the reasons. The next reason that we procrastinate is perfectionism. We're perfectionists. If you wait to be perfect, and this is in Ecclesiastes, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. 
If you wait for things to be perfect, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. You don't have the time or the money to wait for things to be perfect. The number three reason that we procrastinate is fear. And this is from Proverbs. The fear of a man is a trap. It says, have you been postponing going to the dentist? Or maybe getting that surgery that you really, really need? You've been putting it off? Maybe you're not sharing your faith at work like you'd like to. You've been putting that off. Ask yourself, what am I afraid of? What's holding me back? If it's fear, then it's something that you're afraid of that's keeping you from it. The fourth reason is anger. A lazy person is as bad as someone who is destructive. And that's from Proverbs 18. Procrastination is a way to get back at people in a very passive way. Mom asked me to clean my room. I'm not going to clean it just because I'm mad at her. She won't let me go out and play. I'm not going to clean my room. We put off things because we have anger. And the last reason of the five reasons is laziness. Lazy people want much but get little, while the diligent are prospering. That is from Proverbs 13. One of the most popular words in America is easy. Any advertising you see, the word easy is the most popular word. Can you imagine a book that's the best seller at the bookstore that has a title, 10 Very Difficult Steps to Change Your Life? I don't think it would sell. They're hard. Or how about 15 Difficult Ways to Get Into Shape? We're drawn to the word easy. We want easy ways to get into shape. We want easy ways to have the six-pack abs. We want easy ways to get physically fit. We don't want the difficult ways. They are difficult. The next time you find yourself procrastinating and ask yourself why, then ask God to help you to overcome one of these five reasons one or more of these five reasons, more than one can come into play. So now let's look real quickly at uh, biblical ways of changing our behavior, how we can address this. Um, we know from uh, past studies in the book of uh, Philippians that says, uh, there is nothing I cannot master with the help of Christ who gives me strength. Remember that passage? We did a whole sermon on that. And he who gives me strength. Number one, stop making excuses. The lazy man is full of excuses, according to Proverbs 22. What have you been saying you're going to do one of these days? What do you make excuses about? The number one excuse that I hear, when things get a little bit better, or when things slow down, then I'll do this. When I get my life together, that's when I'll start coming to church. Isn't that what church is all about? Things are never going to get easy. Things are never going to settle down. There will always be busy times. The number two says, start today. Not next month, not next week, or tomorrow. Start today. And in Proverbs it says, never boast about tomorrow. You don't know what will happen between now and then. We all should be able to write down the three things that God wants us to do. Three individual things that God wants to do for ourselves, for our family, and for other people that we love. When you get the time, when things settle down, Take the easy approach and write those three things that God is asking you to do in those three areas, your personal life, your family, and other people that you love. Write three things down and then get to it. Establish a very planned schedule. In Proverbs, it says, a wise man plans ahead, a fool does not. There's an old saying that if you plan to fail, then you plan, I mean, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. 
you need a plan for your life and something that you can stick with it. Number four is face your fears. If there is a fear that's keeping you from getting something done, face them, hit them head on. We hate to admit that we are fearful. We hate to admit that we have fears. We're afraid that it's a sign of weakness when truly it's a sign of humility. And God loves a humble, humble person. Admit what your fears are and hit them head on. Number five is focus on the gain that you're going to get when you get something done and not the pain. Focus on the results that you're going to get, how you will feel when it's done. Focus on that and not the actual task of getting it done. Keep your eyes on the goal. In Galatians 6, we learn that, So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we reap a harvest. Jesus never said that life would be easy. In fact, he said, in this life, you will have trouble. We said it before. It's, he didn't say you might have trouble or you could have trouble. He said you will have trouble. Keep your, excuse me, keep your focus on Christ, your focus on God, face your fears, and do it today. If you need to say you're sorry to someone, say it. If you need to say to someone that you love them, Say it. Say it now. Don't wait until it's too late. Come before winter. And finally, if you've been asked by God to do something, do it now. Today. Not tomorrow or next week, but today. We prioritize our activities. What's important to you? What are your priorities? Are majoring in minors a priority? Getting the little things done out of the way before you tackle the big thing, is that a priority? Or is your priority the big thing? Focus on the results. Point is, whatever you've been asked to do, no matter when it comes or how it comes to you, come before winter. Do it and do it now. Amen. Amen. We can have our ushers come forward, please.